Good morning, everyone, and welcome to our first ever Friends Day. My name is Catherine Wu, and I am the COO of ENS Labs, and I will be your MC this morning. Um, I first went to DevCon in 2018, that was in Prague, and it's been really incredible to see how much the Ethereum ecosystem has grown in just the past few years. We have, I believe, 12,000 confirmed attendees to the main DevCon event this year, and maybe this is not the best metric, but 700 side events. And all of this is to say, in a week where there are 700 side events, we are really honored that you have chosen to spend at least one of the days here with us. So Friends Day is a celebration of builders who are working to bridge the Web 2 and Web 3 gap um, to really build towards true decentralization um, and who care about on-chain sovereign identity. Um, and we have a really packed agenda today. So just to go over really quickly, we're gonna kick off with a keynote with, uh, from ENS Labs with an exciting announcement. Um, and we'll follow up with a diverse uh, perspective of Web3 Voices. And everyone here is working not just to advance all the causes and values we care about, but ultimately to grow the Ethereum pie bigger. Um, so without further ado, um, we have a special surprise guest today. Um, he can't make it here in person, but he has recorded a virtual welcoming speech. Um, so with that, I have a video to play that's gonna be from Nick Johnson, the co-founder and lead developer of ENS. Hi friends. I'm incredibly disappointed that I wasn't able to make it to DevCon this year and much more importantly to our first Friends Day. Uh, believe me, I would have done anything I could to have been with you in person today, but sadly it just wasn't possible this year. And how incredible is this? Our first conference dedicated to ENS. I still find it incredible to consider how ENS has gone from being a side project I created soon after joining the EF to the enormous community project it is today in just a few years. Today is about celebrating builders and innovators who are working hard to make Web3 safer, simpler, and more user-friendly. Friends Day serves to highlight ENS's industry-leaning role in shaping a seamless, accessible internet of the future as a natural bridge between Web 2 and Web 3. We'll recognize the incredible work done by builders in the ecosystem. Last DevCon, I was humbled to receive one of the first Diva Awards on behalf of ENS. You can see it on the bookshelf behind me. The EF awarded it for building a successful project without compromising on our principles, and that's something that's incredibly important to me. As we grow, it's crucial we don't lose sight of the fact that ENS is built, not with a mentality of number go up, but instead with more a mentality of airdropping responsibility. We want all of you to be part of ensuring that ENS continues to be built for its users and builders first and foremost. 2024 has been an incredible year for ENS, probably the start of ENS's true breakthrough into the mainstream, with huge integrations including Google, PayPal and GoDaddy, only the first of many to come, I'm sure. Today, you'll be hearing about the next generation of ENS and the incredible things we have planned. You'll be hearing about our focus on L2 and how that will enable ENS to scale so it can reach everyone in the world, as well as the new technical innovations it will enable. We'll talk about both our own L2 solution and how we'll continue to support ENS on every other L2 alongside it. Finally, I'd like to thank the incredible team at ENS Labs. You're the best team a founder could ask for. I never set out intending to build or found a company but all of you have made it an absolute pleasure to do so. Thank you also to the DAO, its delegates and stewards. Your work moving forward the vision of a truly neutral, decentralized naming system as a public good is what ensures ENS stays true to its roots and serves the people it was built to serve. And thank you to the community, all of the builders and users. Without you, ENS would be just another in a long line of good ideas that didn't gain traction. Your efforts and dedication are what has made ENS the success it is today. Now you're going to hear from some incredible speakers about how we're building the next generation of ENS, the impact it's going to have on the world, and most importantly, what you can do on and with ENS. I'm sorry I couldn't be with you here today, but you couldn't be in more capable hands, and I look forward to seeing what you all build and create with ENS at its core. I'll be following along online with bated breath. Good morning, everyone. 
and welcome to the first ever Friends Day. My name is Jeff Lau, and I'm a co-founder of Enos. I'm really sad that Nick, my friend and fellow co-founder, isn't able to, to be with us today on such a special day as well. But I'll do my best in his stead to begin this inaugural conference for ENS. Most of you will know Nick. He's really the face of ENS and very much our own Vitalik. He's a visionary, super smart, but also driven by strong principles. But it also takes about 10 seconds to get his jokes. I met Nick in May of 2017, just after the initial launch of ENS, and he and a few other Redditors from our Ethereum funded um, the very first ENS app, and uh, I was the lucky enough one to be selected to design and build it. Spoiler alert, there were only two candidates, so my chances of joining ENS back then was really a coin flip. It was done, it didn't look so good, it was done, it didn't look so good, but it worked, and you know, people used it. But it began my beautiful journey into Web3, Ethereum, and of course, ENS. Now it's 2024, and we have our very own conference, and I still find that totally insane. And I'm his first very own, de own dedicated conference ever. But OK, enough about me. Let's talk, talk, start talking about ENS. I'm sure many of you are very, very familiar with ENS, but let's start with the basics. ENS is a user experience protocol. That means we put users first. This has multiple meanings. We endeavor to create the best user experience to make the blockchain easier and simpler to use. We want our users to be in control of their identity, creating true trustless ownership. And lastly, the protocol is built to be incredibly neutral and permissionless, so anyone, anywhere can use ENS. ENS's humble beginning started with trying to solve one of the innate weaknesses of blockchain. Everything is a long number in hexadecimal, and it's really completely unreadable, right? How are we supposed to scale to millions of users if, they, if the first thing they do when they create their wallet is see this? ENS helps you to turn that into something humans understand, a name. The simplicity of a name is familiar to all of us. As soon as we are born, we are given a name and it forms part of our identity. Whether that large number, sometimes called a hash, represents your identity on Ethereum, a decentralized website, or something else, a name is an order of magnitude more meaningful to people. And ENS serves humans, not machines. And your identity is precious. It could be your business, your online alias, or an autonomous smart contract controlled by AI. The ownership of your identity or identities is, should, be used to, should be yours to control as you wish within the constraints that you set. ENS has several core principles to make our protocol user-centric. Firstly, it's decentralized, meaning there's no single person or entity that controls the levers that govern the protocol. It's permissionless, so anyone can register a name and create an identity without having to state who you are or where you're from. And lastly, the protocol is built to be incredibly neutral. This means doing our best to not have codified privileged actors in the system. We understand, though, that even with having the perfect protocol, it means nothing without users, end users, developers, and applications. Pushing ENS to as many people as possible makes the protocol more useful, and we as ENS Labs you, as the ENS community, we all need to bring more people to use and integrate and grow ENS. That's why today is called Friends Day and not ENS Day. It's a conference to celebrate everyone helping ENS. So let's talk about a few things that ENS has achieved this year. You've all heard of these hyperbolic but illicit scenarios. If you put all your blood vessels and capillaries end to end, well, you probably die, obviously but they'd also stretch around the Earth's equator more than twice. A similar metaphor for ENS would be if you put all of ENS's registration durations end to end. You'd have to start nine million years ago in the late Miocene. Earth was a well, wild realm of change. Saber-toothed tigers stalked sprawling grasslands while early elephants thundered across open savannas. And despite an abundance of large, sharp teeth, I don't know if no one knows this logo, but no one was trying to sell Denticoin to anyone. 
So more seriously though, it really illustrates how, pretty, how damn well we're doing. Here's the basic stats. Almost 2 million active.eth names, 900,000 users, and almost 200,000 decentralized profiles have been set up. But ENS was never only about .eth. And that's more true than ever now with the explosion of CCIP read and off-chain subnames. So a truer picture of ENS's popularity has to take into account the enormous number of names using a number of names being used by one of our many partner integrations. And many of these are completely trustless and cost-free. Let's do a quick aside, though, and define CCIP read for those who don't want to know what it is. CCIP read is an Ethereum improvement pro proposal created in 2020 to scale ENS off, F1, off of L1. It's a standard that defines how to find data off-chain and verify on-chain. So I'd like to enlist one of our new friends, Earl, to help us explain this. Hey, I need that data, says Earl. Earl gets a reply. Hey, actually, it's not on Ethereum. Here's where you can find it. Go get it yourself from the server. Earl then goes to the server and grabs the data. Simple, right? But the example doesn't stop there. You still need to verify the integrity of the data. Essentially, is it accurate and complete? CCIP read makes this super simple. It has a verification function on the contract that you called, and you can pass the data to it and ask for confirmation. And your contract will apply with a yes, no. In this case, the contract verifies, yep, the, ver the data's good, and Earl can now proceed. This is all trustless because the verification function is codified in the immutable contract on Ethereum. And with this, you've offloaded all the data, all the, all the state to somewhere else, and relied only on Ethereum L1 for verification. And this is what powers many of the integrations in ENS today, and I'll talk about a few of them now. Linear.eth released in August of this year and allowed users to mint a Linear.eth subname on the Linear L2 and take full advantage of CCIP read to be totally trustless. When you resolve a Linear.eth name behind the scenes, their gateway returns the resolution of the name, which is all verified in real time before re returning the result to you. Base.eth also uses the same CCIP read approach, but hosting their names on the Coinbase's base chain, showing how easy it is to apply CCIP read to subnames to, to solutions across any L2 you choose. Next, Uniswap. Uniswap launched free Uniswap subdomains on uni.eth. Uniswap names are hosted off-chain, and with Uniswap's gateway, signing records and returning them via CCIP read. Anyone can set up in the Uniswap, mob Uniswap mobile app, and over a million names have been registered already. And lastly, the, the thousand pound gorilla Coinbase. As of today, Coinbase has reported over 12 million CB.ID names to their users, and making the largest appointment of ENS to end users since we launched, and really demonstrating the value of rolling our ENS infrastructure to everyone. And that has really been the theme of the past year or more, bringing ENS to more people, more affordably, and with less know-how required. CCIP, CCIP read and off-chain names have been the foundation of that and have led to a number of successful integrations. Almost 40 million active names, 13 million users, and over 400,000 decentralized profiles. Really, .eth only paints a small portion of the picture of the success of ENS, and you really to see all the, sub to see all the subdomain integrations to really know truly wide-ranging truly wide wide -ranging ENS really is. But ENS is not only about subdomains. Our success is about how widely integrated we are, allowing names to be used out in the wild. Integrations are one of the most important success metrics for ENS. Imagine owning a, cre a credit card, a Visa credit card, but no one accepts Visa. This is the problem we need to tackle by bringing in large integrations that allow the use of ENS within their existing users, allowing ENS resolution to exist outside of our eco chamber. And this year has been a fantastic year for integrations, and I'd like to tell you about a few of them today. First up is .box. Up is .box. In collaboration with 3DNS, it's a fully, the first truly blockchain native, fully ENS enabled TLD. .box registrations are all recorded on Ethereum, and every .box name is automatically ENS enabled. While not an integration specifically, I'd like to quickly highlight gasless DNSSEC one of our biggest technological advances in ES to date. ENS 
top level DNS, top level domain, almost since day one, almost since day one. But important one, one of them came with a substantial fee due to the gas required to trustly verify your ownership of the name using DNSSEC. Gasless DNSSEC combines our trustless DNS import functionality with the gateway architecture of CCIP read. It makes it possible to make nearly any DNS name function inside ENS without any transactions or gas fees required whatsoever. Simply set a text record, enable DNSSEC on your name, and it will just work the same as a .eth name in any supported application. And one of the first to use the power of gasless DNSSEC was GoDaddy, who added built-in support for every name registered through them, removing the usability barrier of understanding how to set up DNSSEC and how to format and set text records. You can set up a DNS name to work in ENS using GoDaddy in just a few clicks. And GoDaddy has over 80 million names registered to them, 20 million customers, and just this one integration by itself vastly improves the network effect of ENS. But it's not just domain-related companies that are integrating us. Bitwise, a traditional finance company who released the Ethereum ETF product this year, has created ENS subnames on each of the addresses that hold the ETH back in the ETF. This is a really great use case, and hopefully tr makes tracking custody of on-chain assets more transparent and more auditable. And payment providers have started to adopt ENS too, most notably PayPal and Venmo who rolled out ENS support for their crypto wallets to all US users earlier this year. Venmo has 90 million US users, and PayPal has over 400 million accounts globally. And lastly, can you really say you've been a successful protocol until Google integrates you? Today, you can search your .eth name on Google, and it will automatically show you your balance and your resolved address. Google is the gateway to the internet, and ENS has become important enough to be in integrated into the most used search engine. But what do these large integrations bring to ENS? Well, subdomains means more users. More people using ENS for the first time and broaden the social network that ENS creates. And large integrations like PayPal, Venmo, and Google means there are more places for ENS to be used, making ENS fundamentally more useful. And these integrations are growing the ENS pie significantly. But of course, most ENS names also resolve to an Ethereum or L2 address, and that is pushing forward Ethereum as a whole. And we're proud to be one of Ethereum's BD teams. Born out of Ethereum, born out of Ethereum, we at ENS have never forgotten our roots, or the values that came out of that. Ethereum is not just in our name, but in the DNA of e ENS itself. Most of the previous integrations we discussed were born out of ERC-3668, the other name for CCIP read, an EIP that is helping Ethereum scale to L2s. We care about the entire ecosystem itself, because without that infinite garden, ENS itself wouldn't have room to flourish. In that same theme, we've also been pushing forward L2 UX with some EIPs in the pipelines, the first of which is ERC-7785 that will enshrine ENS to be the namespace to allow discovery of new L2s. In the future, we hope to push further EIPs that will help the fractionalization of layer two addresses and addresses problem head on. ENS works on these problems because of course, selfishly, it helps ENS and it helps ENS proliferate. But selflessly, it also helps the entire Ethereum ecosystem as well. And both of these EIPs have come from ideas from dialogues from Win the community and also Vitalik himself. Ethereum has had many scaling plans, but the current one is roll-up centric. Roll-ups are an evolution of other L2 solutions. If people remember state channels and plasma from 2017, 2018. And now we have roll-ups, which are far more powerful than the previous iterations of what it meant to be an L2. And roll-ups really allow a user experience that is just not possible on Ethereum L1. There are so many L2s to choose from, and we really took our time this year to look into the benefits of all of them and try and narrow down which of the L2s made sense to deploy to and create ENS's new home. It's been seven years since we started this journey. Back in 2017, we released ENS, a revolutionary protocol that started the journey for solving decentralized identity and blockchain user experience. It was young and it was early, and we didn't even have a proper application to manage names, which is where I came in initially. In 2019, we released the permanent registrar, bringing in the commit reveal step to prevent front running, before MEV was even a thing. 
getting rid of the victory auction, and simplifying the steps for a user to get a name. In 2021, we decentralized the protocol into the DAO, releasing the ENS governance token. The DAO is now three years old and has created an immense ecosystem of builders and stewards that move the protocol forward. And in 2020, and in 2022, we released the name wrapper, tackling some of the main pain points of the five-year-old ENS registry, allowing subdomains to be truly trustless. But what, about 2020, but what about 2024? Well, in 2024, I'm pleased to announce that we're taking ENS into a layer two by building our very own chain, which we're calling Namechain. We really thought long and hard whether it was necessary, but I really do think our own chain makes sense, possibly more so than any other app chain roll-up. Most protocols that move to a roll-up want one thing, cheaper transactions. Of course, at ENS, we're no different. But the industry standard success for metric, a success metric for a roll-up these days is TVL, or total value locked. This is natural if you're an L2, as if you're competing for TVL to show you have users. But for ENS, it's different. We don't need to prioritize TVL. ENS already has users, and we can really prioritize things that other L2s don't. So we're gonna be building L2 to L2 bridging right into the protocol, so you can do things like commit whilst you bridge and pay from your preferred L2. This will allow you to start your ENS journey from any L2, lowering the barrier for entry to buy your first name. And this is one of the primary reasons why we want to launch our own chain. Deploying to another public chain makes it harder to build that UX right into the protocol. And being able to control the entire stack from protocol to governance means the rollup is here to serve ENS and naming. Important for us at ENS, for us at ENS, as we are committed to being L2 agnostic. Now we're not ready to, who, to say who yet, but we have selected a partner we feel embodies all the value that values that ENS does, as well as a roadmap that matches where we want to be. So although I can't tell you who the partner is yet, I can tell you a bit more about what we want from our L2. So today, ZK EVMs are the only way to get transaction finality in a reasonable amount of time. Because ENS is one of the only applications that require reading state from L1, we need the fastest finality, so we can ensure that everything can be trustlessly read from other L2s. And ZK EVMs use ZK proofs to prove the correctness of a state transition on L2 and commit this to L1. The ENS re resolution process can then use CCIP read to verify the data from Namechain. Contrasting this to an optimistic rollup, the industry standard will require us to wait seven days before your name is ready to use. Secondly, of course, the stack must be completely open source, allowing it to be easily audited and edited if required. And lastly, you, and lastly, you really care about credible neutrality and decentralization of ENS, and maintaining that is a priority. The partner we select must also care about these values too. And one of the key open issues in L2s is decentralizing the prover and the sequencer. There are a few re research options out there right now, such as shared sequencing and base rollups, that are seriously exploring breaking the se single sequencer model. And we believe that these standards, as these be standards begin to settle, it'll be something name chain can adopt. As for us, decentralization is really non-negotiable. So Namechain is the L2 we're building, but we're not just building an L2. ENS v2 is a ground up redesign of ENS, and only one component of that is having a dedicated L2. It's designed to make it more flexible, more accessible, and more affordable, so we can continue the momentum started with CCIP read and off-chain names, and expand its utility to every user and application that needs it. How are we gonna do that? How are we gonna do that? Well, first, we redesigned, redefined how names are registered and recorded with a completely redesigned registry. Second, .eth names will be recorded and be, by default hosted on our dedicated L2 name chain. And finally, a user-driven migration with backwards compatibility. Let's explore these in a bit more detail. So .eth on Namechain means that all registration and renewals will no longer live on L1, but instead on Namechain. And storing on Namechain means that registration renewal, renewal gas will be reduced significantly. Now, although Ethereum has its conveniences, it's not a long-term solution for gas prices on L1. 
Having registration on name chain means we can ensure registration gas costs are as close to zero as possible. However, even though .eth will move to name chain, name resolution, the most important part of ENS, largely remains untouched and begins from Ethereum itself. Let me reiterate that. ENS name resolution remains anchored on L1, and that is a fundamental difference between ENS and other protocols moving to an L2. We do not fractionalize our protocol. We connect it together and remain as one. And this is how we remain L2 agnostic. Okay, let's talk about the complete technical rewrite of the ENS registry. Registries are contracts that store data about that name. The current registry stores the owner and resolver records, and currently all names are stored in a single flat registry. This design is straightforward and has several advantages, but also a couple of drawbacks. One of which that it's difficult to define custom rules for name issuance and ownership, which has led to workarounds like the name wrapper. Another is that because each name exists independently in the registry, when a name is transferred or deleted, all names remain unchanged. We're solving both of these problems while adding more flexibility to the system as a whole by introducing a new registry design in ENS v2. In v2, each name optionally has its own registry, which deals exclusively with its subnames. There's a root registry, which contains all of the top-level names, and each top-level name has a registry containing all the second-level names, such as nick.eth and so forth. And every name optionally has a resolver, which functions exactly the same as it does in v1. Using hierarchy of registries has a number of advantages. Anyone who owns a name can now supply the registry implementation of their choice, giving them full control of how subnames are issued and controlled. This allows the functionality of the name wrapper and more, while preserving the flexibility of name owners to set their own rules for name ownership or even name resolution. When a name changes hands or if an owner wants to start from scratch, they can easily replace the registry for a name entirely erasing all existing subnames, allowing a very easy and fuss-free way of clearing up the hierarchy of your name. And of course, you can optionally prevent this in a similar way to the name wrapper, creating completely trustless names, as in the original ENS v1 with name wrapper. Likewise, because each registry exists independently, we can even insert registries at multiple places in the ENS hierarchy. When you're ready to move on from a subname to a .eth name of your own, you can bring everything with you while still ensuring your old name functions just as it did before. L2 support was a consideration from the beginning of the de design process of V2, and that means we can also deploy V2 contracts to L2 networks. Combined with CCIP read, this makes it possible to seamlessly stitch together a coherent namespace from multiple distinct networks and L2s. V2 takes advantage of this at its core, and we're going to be moving the .eth registry and all .e second level name registrations to Namechain. All new name registrations and renewals will take place on Namechain, and users will begin to migrate hosting of their records and subnames over to Namechain. Or if they wish, they can remove their records and move it to another L2 of their choice. This architecture reinforces how we are staying L2 agnostic, beginning everything from L1, but only moving .e to Namechain, while supporting ENS on all other L2s. And in line with ENS's core principles, moving to V2 is an entirely user-driven and opt-in process. All registrations will be transferred to the new L2 chain, but because by its nature, a registry must be stored all in one location, the names themselves, their records, and subnames, however, continue to exist on Ethereum L1 or any other L2 or off-chain storage solution. After launch, users can migrate their names to V2 in a single transaction, and this will move their name from the legacy flat ENS registry to the new hierarchical one. And at the same time, they can choose to either leave the name on L1 or migrate to the name chain if it's not hosted somewhere else. And names that aren't migrated will continue to function indefinitely. The new ENS contracts are programmed to automatically fall back to looking up names in the V1 registry. This means that for names that are owned by mutable contracts or for users that can't or won't upgrade, functionality of their name is safeguarded forever. So, so far, we've talked a lot about the design and architecture of V2 and shared a lot of exciting things, but you may be wondering, what does this look like in practical terms? I'd like to invite Dom, our lead UX designer, up on stage to discuss what it's going to look like to use V2 and paint a better picture of the user experience we'd like to create for ENS users.
Thank you, Jeff, and good morning, everyone. Uh, I'm Dom. I'm a senior designer here at ENS Labs. Uh, let's talk about L2 UX. So L2s aren't necessarily a UX improvement. Uh, rather, they're usually a bit of a UX trade-off. So the UX is improved in L2s by making the chain cheaper and faster, but friction is increased by needing on and off ramps. And this works great for a lot of dApps, especially ones that expect and encourage frequent user interactions. But ENS is unique. We have, our users behave in unique ways. Most of our users only transact infrequently and at unpredictable intervals, such as updating a profile or registering a name. So for ENS users, bridging on and off is a significant extra UX overhead. And we want ENS v2 and Namechain to be a true UX improvement. With that in mind, we're treating Namechain and ENS v2 as a whole new design space. We're exploring whole new experiences that might otherwise be prohibitive or impossible. So let's look at an example. Here we have a prototype exploring a hypothetical registration flow. So not everything here might be achievable, but this is an insight into how we're thinking about the UX for Namechain. Here a user has found a name, my name, that they'd like, that they'd like to register. The first step is, of course, to connect your wallet. Here you can see in this wallet mockup, the user is set to base instead of mainnet or chain. We may no longer need to force users to switch, to switch networks. Instead, we can detect the network that the wallet is already using and then assume that's where they want it to start from. Here the payment method has been populated to base ETH in, since that's the network they're connecting from. Once the user begins that registration transaction, you can see a few things in this mockup. The first is that they're paying and transacting from base, not Namechain, and not using Namechain ETH. The second is that the gas is being subsidized, meaning that the user is truly seeing the price of their name, and they're truly paying $5 a year. We still follow the commit reveal pattern because this is the correct way to avoid front running. But you can see from this commit transaction that's been, that it's been triggered from base without needing to connect to Namechain. Once the commit has been completed, we begin the usual wait. However, we may be able to reduce this. In this example, it's been reduced from the usual 60 seconds to 10. This is a goal we're exploring for Namechain. Once the wait is complete, we're exploring having the reveal transaction begin on its own instead of asking the user for a second transaction action. This could be achieved with smart contracts, deployed to Namechain, or SCA-style improvements to EOAs. And there you have it. And with a single transaction from the user, they now own a name on Namechain, registered from base, with an avatar and primary name set. While this prototype is hypothetical, we think that much of this is achievable due to the technical improvements coming from ENS v2 and Namechain. The most important of these are, of course, fees. As with all L2s, Namechain will have significantly lower fees. This lets us explore new flows where we no longer need to worry about gas optimization and can introduce new flows where they might make sense for the user, not for the gas. With our own L2, we can also seriously explore how smart contract accounts will work with Namechain and might even be integrated into the network. This will let us explore entirely new interactions and design patterns. And of course, the new registries hierarchy that Jeff discussed. This lets ENS names adopt new powers and lets devs explore the scope of these powers. These and other technical changes allow us to explore new ideas. For example, onboarding flows that let users set up their entire online identities in a single transaction. This could include guided experiences teaching new users how to manage their profile, create and use subnames, or move their names to cold storage. Bundled transactions letting us explore things like bulk creation and management of subnames, managing primary names with a single transaction, and of course, registering with a single transaction. Gas subsidies, which we could use to encourage users to complete actions beneficial to both them and the protocol, such as first profile setup to avoid stagnant profiles, adding additional chain addresses, or registrations themselves. Integrating bridging into each transaction, potentially removing the need for on and off ramps completely, or even holding ETH on name chain at all. Whole new permission systems built into the registries, letting builders and users create custom tailored permissions for their own use cases. For example, a simple on-chain uh, on subname registry. Or registry aliases, which lets you create a single profile that is used by all of your names and subnames without maintaining them individually. With these and other updates, we have the room to explore new ways of registering, owning, and managing your names. 
The prototype was hypothetical, but indicative of some UX goals we're pursuing with Namechain. These goals are to reduce the overall cost of interacting with ENS, of course, reduce the number of transactions in all possible situations, and let users transact from their name of choice without the need for the on and off ramps that can make L2 so painful. With these UX goals in mind, we're aiming to make Namechain a true improvement to ENS UX without the usual L2 trade-offs. We're very excited to explore the UX potential of ENS v2 and Namechain, particularly me, and we're always open to feedback. And with that, I'd like to introduce Greg to talk a bit about the developer experience. To be successful, ENS v2 needs to have first-class support for third-party developers. So here's Greg, a developer advocate for ENS, to tell us more. Cool. Hey, everybody. I'm Greg, and I'm excited to share a little bit more about what the developer experience of ENS v2 and Namechain will be like. But let's first start by taking a look at how most developers integrate ENS today. Over the last seven and a half years, ENS has earned a lot of goodwill amongst the Ethereum community. And because of this, we're already integrated into most of the popular developer tools that you know and love today, such as VM, Ethers, Wagme, and more. This makes building simple integrations easy, like resolving a name into an address when you're transferring assets from a wallet app, but doesn't always consider more complex ENS interactions that really should be just as easily accessible to developers. So first of all, taking a step back, ENS was built in a very different time. Where rollups didn't really exist, almost every user just depended on an EOA on layer one, and gas fees frankly weren't much of an issue. But fast forward to today, and a majority of users are transacting on layer twos, getting onboarded with smart contract accounts, and honestly, it's sometimes difficult to use certain parts of ENS in this ecosystem. And so to solve this, we're bringing a whole suite of upgrades to the architecture and smart contract implementation of ENS v2. With the NSV2 and Namechain, it will be significantly easier to register names, update records, manage decentralized websites, and more. It will be trivial to initiate transactions from any chain, sponsor user fees, and generally be easier to use ENS as a primary source of identity in a multi-chain world. For a tangible example of what this should feel like, think about how easy it is to update your bio on Instagram or Twitter or X. ENSV2 and Namechain should enable developers to build experiences that are really just as easy to do that as it is to update text records or address records on your ENS name. Technically speaking, a big part of this is powered by new smart contracts that allow for signature verification rather than simply expecting that the sender of a transaction is an owner of the given name, which is what happens today in a lot of the ENS contracts. This makes it significantly easier to work with smart contract wallets, relayers, and other common infrastructure that we all depend on today. And the best part about these smart contract updates is that you don't even have to wait for ENSV2 to start seeing some of the improvements. I'm excited to announce that primary names are coming to layer two and are available on test nets today. For seven years, primary names have only existed on layer one, which limits their use to people who are willing and able to pay Ethereum L1 gas fees. Being able to set a primary name on any chain effectively for free will be a huge unlock for the Web3 user experience. This is the first example of a more flexible smart contract that you'll be seeing more of in ENS v2, and marks the first time that any ENS contract is officially deployed to a layer two, and I'm excited to see us go further in this direction. So let's imagine a future where a new user signs up for your app. In this example, let's say they don't already have an ENS name. They might sign in with Face ID, which creates a smart wallet in the background, and choose a username as you would in any sort of Web2 application. This username can be a .eth subname that is minted on Namechain, even if the application is rooted on base. It will be set as their primary name so that this username can move with them across applications on base, and it will be a new way for them to receive any sort of on-chain asset from any crypto application. This is, of course, because ENS is a universal Web3 on-chain identity. It's a global profile that works across applications. We are confident that L2 primary names will make it significantly easier for developers to build with ENS in a layer two world and are excited to get this in your hands. Reverse registrars, which are the smart contracts that power L2 reverse resolution or primary names, 
are live today on a handful of test nets and be, should be coming to mainnet by the end of this year. To be clear, for non-developers, there's nothing to do at this time, but developers, if you're interested in this, then we'll have info on how you can start playing around immediately. And so that was ENSV2 and smart contracts. Now let's talk a little bit about the developer experience of Namechain, the new L2. So while the idea of a new chain might sound daunting, and I know there are a lot of them recently, I want to emphasize that all of the tools you developers use today to build on Ethereum, you'll still be able to use on Namechain. This means you'll be able to write smart contracts and deploy them with Hardhat and Foundry, or use Wagme and VM, or any of the libraries that I mentioned earlier to build front-end and back-end applications, and more. Basically, we're bringing ENS up to speed with what you've come to expect from building in a layer two world. The surface area of ENS is expanding from a protocol on Ethereum to a network on Ethereum. This means we have to consider not only the developer experience of both individually, but also the two of those together as a whole. A major part of this is making sure it's easy to interact with Namechain from other layer twos. I'm happy to share that a number of teams building in the cross-chain execution space have already agreed to support Namechain on day one, ensuring not only a smooth user experience, but also a smooth developer experience. These type of integrations are what makes Dom's mockups that you saw earlier a reality, being able to register names, update records, and do all that stuff from any chain, even though it settles on Namechain. That's all I have to share for now. We feel really good about what L2 primary names, ENSV2, and Namechain will bring to the table for developers and are excited to keep you updated as we move forward. I'll hand it back to Jeff to close this out. Thank you, Greg and Dom. That's been amazing to really see kind of the user experience of how ENSV2 and Namechain and also L2 primary names. Um, L2 primary names is like a very special thing for me because I worked on the ENS IP for many, many months and I'm really, really happy to, to see that go live now on testnet and hopefully to main it later this year. And of course, also the, the user experience. Wow, like I think for me, it gives me this thought of um, almost like five years ago now when me and Nick were bouncing ideas back and forth about the initial permanent registrar. And if anyone here, I mean, I'm sure all of you have got a .eth name, but you, you have to wait one minute between commit and reveal. And actually back then, the original story was Nick wanted to make it 10 minutes. And I was like, Nick, you, we can't do this. Like, no one's going to use us. Uh, thankfully, I managed to convince him to bring it down to one minute. But imagine it going down to you know seconds, um, single blocks. That would be absolutely amazing. And I think there's so much to explore with you know, V2 UX. Um, yeah. Uh, I'm, uh, it's a little bit emotional for me. I mean, coming to this like first conference ever um, for ENS, like I'm, it's really been such a long time. It's been seven years since the initial launch of ENS, and you know the stats I showed earlier: the two million active.eth names, nine million years of registrations, 14 million total ENS names, including all of our integrations. I I couldn't imagine that ENS would be so successful, you know, this many years later. So really, like. I mean, I just want to give you, you know, can I give you a, a round of applause to everyone here that's made ENS what it is today? Because these numbers are really just incredible, and it's not just thanks to the people at ENS Labs. It's for everyone here today in the ENS community, championing ENS, using it in your applications, and really being part of our community. You know, I, like, I always like to talk about ENS as a network, just as Greg mentioned. A network is something that gets exponentially stronger with each additional user. And it's not additive, it's multiplicative. So each one of you ENS users is really, really super important to us. And finally, the adventure is not over. You know, if you're looking for a good position at ENS Labs, we're always looking for good people. So if you'd like to work with us, please check out enslabs.org slash jobs for postings. And thank you, and enjoy the rest of the day at Friends Day.